Good day everyone. Today I will be discussing with you another topic in fluid mechanics. But before that, let us have a quick review of our previous lesson on the properties of fluid. So as you can see, there are different properties of fluids. Each of these properties will be useful later on in our analysis, especially now in our topic, fluid statics. By the end of this lesson, there are many things that you should be able to accomplish. So why is it necessary for us to study fluid statics? If you can recall, there are three branches of fluid mechanics. We have fluid statics, kinematics, and we also have fluid dynamics. The focus of this lesson is on the fluid statics. This is the study of fluid which can either be gaseous or liquid that are at rest. So if we deal with liquid, we call it hydrostatics. And if we deal with gas, it is called aerostatics. For fluids at rest, they are fluids that experiences no shear stresses. So in, in viscosity, we learned that because of this property, fluid undergo shear stresses. But for fluids at rest, they do not experience shear stress. Thus, only normal pressure forces are present for fluid at rest. The importance of studying these normal forces produced by static fluids can be helpful in analyzing as these fluids tend, for example, to overturn concrete dumps or burst pressure vessels or may break lock gates on canals, which may cause excessive flooding for a particular area, for example. We hear news in China, for example, that kills millions of people because of the breakage of these concrete dumps. So analyzing these normal forces is the very uh, heart of fluid statics and also the instruments that we can use in order to measure these pressures that are existing in these uh, systems. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to identify the different concepts in fluid statics solve problems in pressure measurement of fluids at rest, hydrostatic forces, and buoyancy, and display unity in a cooperative problem-solving activity, which we will do later on. So this will be the outline of this discussion. So let us first start with pressure. Pressure is defined as the normal force exerted by a fluid per unit area. So take note that we use pressure when dealing with fluids like gas and liquid. But when we deal with solid, we call it normal stress. But for the normal force exerted by fluid, we call it pressure. The unit for pressure in SI is Newton per meter squared, which is equivalent to Pascal. Take note that sometimes we use large pressures such as 1 megapascal is denoted by 1 MPA. It is equivalent to 1 million pascal or 10 to the power of 6 pascal. For the conversion of units between bar, pascal, megapascal, and kilopascal, you can show it in the presentation. And you can also use conversion between atmospheric pressure, pascal, and kilopascal as well as bars. So these are the different units of pressure and their conversion. So there are three pressures that you might exist in the study of fluid statics, the absolute, gauge, and the vacuum pressure. So what's the difference between the three? Absolute pressure is the actual pressure at a given position. It is measured relative to the absolute vacuum and it's commonly used in gas and vapors. So that's why in thermodynamics, wherein we are dealing with steam, for example, the steam table pressures are in absolute pressure. So we use absolute pressure when dealing with gas and vapor. Gauge pressure, on the other hand, is the difference between the absolute and the local atmospheric pressure. Sometimes we call it barometric pressure because it is measured using an instrument called 
the barometer. Usually, these instruments, the reading in these instruments, or most pressuring, pressure measuring devices, are measured in gauge. So the the pressure that you can get in these instruments are the gauge pressure. These are commonly used in liquids. So for absolute, we usually you we commonly use it in gas and vapor, but for gauge pressure, it's commonly used in liquids. We also have another um concept here the vacuum pressure which is just the pressure below the atmospheric pressure so we call it at vacuum pressure when the pressure is below the atmospheric pressure so to illustrate the difference between the three so you can see here a dotted line um, broken line so this is this represents the atmospheric pressure and then the solid line here represents the absolute vacuum or the wherein the absolute pressure is equal to zero so when the absolute pressure is equal to zero then this is the absolute vacuum then this line here represents the atmospheric pressure you can see that above the atmospheric pressure we get the gauge so the measurement above the atmospheric is the gauge pressure the measurement of pressure below the atmospheric pressure is the vacuum pressure so if we use this um, relationship then the gauge pressure so the gauge pressure is equals to the absolute pressure this line here minus the atmospheric pressure so it's the, this is the gauge pressure the vacuum pressure on the other hand is the atmospheric pressure minus the absolute pressure so that's the vacuum pressure that's why vacuum pressure sometimes is then is a negative pressure So for a pressure at a point, say for example, we have here a very small um, point of a liquid and then we wanted to get the pressure at that point. The pressure at a point in a fluid has the same magnitude in all directions. So for this point here, this point here and this point here, for this particular element, the pressure at all point has the same magnitude regardless of the direction. So whether it is horizontal, it's vertical, or is it inclined. So for a particular point in a fluid, the pressure would be the same, regardless of the direction. So in the absence of shear forces, this is applicable to fluids in motion as well as fluids at rest. For the variation of pressure with depth, the pressure is the same at all points on a horizontal plane in a given fluid regardless of the geometry, provided that the points are interconnected by the same fluid. Say, for example, you have here a container. It contains water. Uh, maybe it's an ocean because it has a lot of uh, different profiles in its uh, surface at the bottom. So you can see that the pressure is the same at all points. So the pressure at point A, point B, point C, point D, point E, F, and G is just the same because uh, the variation of pressure with depth because of the variation of pressure with depth so for these points they have the same pressure since they are located at the same depth so assuming that the same fluid uh, exists in all of these points so that is the variation of pressure with with depth so it does not matter whether the geometry is different as long as they are located at the same depth and they are interconnected by the same fluid, then they have the same pressure. So the pressure at point A, B, C, D, E, F, and G has the same. And the pressure at H and I is the same. Okay, so the pressure at H is different from I because H is, um, the fluid in H is mercury. So though they are located at the same level, but since H is mercury, then they are not the same. So the pressure in H is not equal to I. So you can see it here. If it's mercury, then we have water here. So that's the variation of pressure with depth. So later on, we will deal with this more. Another important law that will help us to uh, analyze fluids at rest is the Pascal's law. 
according to Pascal's law, pressure in a liquid at rest increases linearly with distance from the free surface. So say for example, you have here a container and the free surface is exposed to the atmospheric pressure or the atmosphere. So the pressure in this liquid increases linearly with distance from the free surface. So as we go deeper and deeper from the free surface, the pressure here increases. So the pressure at point 2 is greater than point 1 and they are related by the formula. The pressure at point 2 is equal to the atmospheric pressure plus the, the formula rho GH. This rho GH is equivalent to the gauge pressure. Take note that since rho and G is equal to specific weight, then we can replace it with gamma H. So you can see, even in actual practice, that the pressure increases as you go deeper and deeper into the body of water. So that's why the design of vessel also or submarines uh, is dependent on the, their depth of operation from the free surface. So that's Pascal's law. So let us have an example for us to understand the relationship between these pressures. So we have here a vacuum gauge connected to a chamber which reads 5.8 PSI at a location where the atmospheric pressure is 14.5 PSI. Determine the absolute pressure in the chamber. So as you can see, we are given with a vacuum gauge. So that is a vacuum pressure of 5.8 PSI. And then we're given with an atmospheric pressure of 14.5 PSI. We are to determine the absolute pressure in that chamber. So knowing the relationship between the three, our FIVA, the vacuum pressure is the atmospheric pressure minus the absolute pressure. Substituting the value of the given, we can get the absolute pressure as 8.7 PSI. So you can see that the absolute pressure is lesser than the atmospheric pressure because we have a negative pressure which is a vacuum pressure another example we have here neglecting the pressure upon the surface and the compressibility of water what is the pressure in pounds per square inch in an inch at a depth of an ore deposit 12,000 feet below the surface of the ocean the specific weight of the ocean water under ordinary condition is 64 pounds per feet cube so here we are given with the depth of the ocean where the ore deposit is found, that is 12,000 feet. And then we're given with the specific weight, gamma, of 64 pound force per feet cube. The unknown, R, the, is the pressure. So what is the pressure at that depth? So to solve this, we will use our relationship. We know that the pressure increases uh, by Pascal's law, it increases. As we go deeper and deeper using this relationship, we can solve that pressure. So substitute neglecting the pressure at the surface. Say for example that we are just concerned with uh, the gauge pressure at that particular point. Then we can get that using the formula rho GH or gamma H. Then substituting the value from the given. And then since we want to get the result in PSI, which is pound per inch, squared then we will convert the square feet to inches squared by using by multiplying it with this conversion factor so we can get the the gauge pressure in pounds per inch squared at the depth which is 5333.3 psi so you can see if the atmospheric pressure say for example is 14.7 psi at the depth the pressure would increase by 5,333.3 PSI at the bottom. So that is a lot of compressive force uh, ex that will be exerted for that ore deposit found at the bottom of the ocean. So now that we understood the different pressures, absolute gauge and vacuum, it's very important also to know the different measuring devices because as this there are the actual operations of, say, for example, these dams, um, these systems, requires this pressure measuring devices for us to know the existing pressure, the actual pressure existing in that particular moment. So uh, an instrument that measures the absolute pressure of the atmosphere is what we call the barometer. So it's for 
a water barometer if a tube has its open and immersed in the liquid that is exposed to the atmospheric pressure. And if the air is exhausted from the tube, the liquid will rise in it. So assuming that there is no liquid found in the tube, as you immerse the end of it to the liquid, the liquid will rise in the tube. As you can see here, we have two types of barometers. We have a mercury barometer and then we have an aneroid barometer. So this is where, this is an example of the stated here that if one of the tube is open and it's immersed in the liquid and it's exposed to the atmosphere, so this particular a container is exposed to the atmosphere, then the liquid will rise, assuming that the air in the tube is exhausted. So this is how we measure then the barometric pressure using a mercury barometer but we also have an aneroid barometer which wherein you can measure the pressure by the deflection of this particular gauge here. So this is the basic barometer. So the atmospheric pressure at a location is simply the weight of the air above that location per unit surface area. So if you draw it in a schematic diagram, so knowing that the that the atmospheric pressure is equal to the weight of the air above at the location that you are measuring the, uh, the atmospheric pressure, then we can derive the, the formula for the atmospheric pressure as this one. So the atmospheric pressure, by balancing this equation, so the atmospheric pressure which acts at the bottom of this liquid here, this particular liquid, is equal to the weight of the air above that location. So the PATM is just equal to the raw GH. So take note that since it is dependent on the, the condition of the air, then the barometric, the atmospheric pressure is dependent not just on the location but also on the weather condition. So that's why whether, even if you are staying just in a, in a particular place, the atmospheric pressure changes depending on the condition of the air. So it's dependent on the weather condition. Say for example, you go to a mountain. So at high altitudes, your car engine will exert, will generate less power and you as a person driving that car would experience lesser oxygen because of the lower density of air at that particular height. Because we know that uh, as you go up and up, the density of air um, decreases and you get lesser oxygen therefore. And as a result, your car will generate less power and your lungs will have difficulty getting oxygen. So that's why we experience some um, difficulty of breathing as we have mountaineering, for example. So let us have an example for us to appreciate this, this kind of measuring instrument, the barometer. We are to determine the atmospheric pressure at a location where the barometric reading is 740 millimeter of mercury and the gravitational acceleration is 9.81 meter per second squared. We assume that the temperature of the mercury to be 10 degrees Celsius, at which its density is 13,570 kilogram per meter cube. So in this problem, we are given with uh, the barometric reading and the uh, mercury barometer, which is 740 mm mercury, the acceleration due to gravity, as well as the density at a particular temperature. And we are looking for the atmospheric pressure. So using the relationship, the atmospheric pressure is equal to rho GH, we substitute the value of the density of mercury, the gravity, and the height in meter. So since it's given in millimeter, we convert it to meter and then we convert it to Pascal so that we can get the atmospheric pressure as 98,510 Pascal which is 98.5 kilopascal. So you can see that at that particular location the in atmospheric pressure the, the pressure atmospheric pressure is 98.5 kilopascal. At standard sea level the atmospheric pressure is 101.325 so this must be at a higher um, elevation. Another measuring instrument for pressure is the Borden gauge. So this Borden gauge is used to measure pressures 
or vacuums. So this is how it would look like in practice. So this is a burden gauge. We also have a transducer. So it also refers to any device that transfers energy in any form from one system to another in order to indicate pressure changes. Our burden gauge is actually an example of a transducer. It's a mechanical transducer because it has an elastic element that converts energy from pressure system to a displacement in a mechanical measuring system. We also have electrical pressure transducer which converts the displacement of a mechanical system to an electrical signal in order to measure the pressure. So this is how electrical pressure transducer looks like. We also have a piezometer. This is also a transducer. So it is a simple device for measuring moderate pressure of liquids. It consists of sufficiently long tube in which the liquid can freely rise without overflowing. Another common measuring instrument is the manometer. So it measures small and moderate pressure differences. It mainly consists of a glass or a plastic U-tube which contains one or more fluids such as mercury, water, alcohol, or oil. It uses heavy fluids to keep the size of the manometer to a manageable level. So imagine if you use a lighter fluid, for example, like water, we would need a very um, large or very big um, level <laughs> or instrument in order to indicate the measurement. But since we are using heavier fluids like mercury, we can manage the rise of the the liquid in the container. So that's that's why our manometer actually has a manageable size also. This is how a basic manometer looks like. For example, if you connect it to a tank, a tank uh, containing gas. So when you connect the manometer to the tank containing the gas or the liquid or the fluid, the manometer will experience a, a increase in its height. And that's where we can get the uh, the pressure difference or the pressure measurement of the gas. So the pressure at point 2 in this basic manometer for example is equals to the pressure of the atmosphere since it is exposed to the atmosphere it's open to the atmosphere plus the rho gh. The rho here refers to the density of our measuring instrument, the fluid in the manometer and the height or the increase in its height. This is the increase in its height. So if you wanted to get the pressure at point 2, which is just equal to the pressure at point 1 because we know that if they are in the same level and the same liquid, then they would have the same pressure. Then pressure at point 2 and 1 would be the same. So the pressure at the interface of gas and this mercury is the same, which is P1 is equal to P2 is equal to P atm plus rho gh. So therefore, we can cancel out this area here in the measurement of pressure. For stack up fluid layers, wherein we use as different kinds of fluids, the pressure change across a fluid layer of density rho and height h is rho gh. So for example, you wanted to get the pressure at the bottom, which is at point 1, when this container is exposed to the atmosphere, then P1 is equal to P atmosphere plus the pressure here because of fluid 1 plus the pressure because of fluid 2 plus the pressure because of fluid 3. So that is if you have multi-fluid manometer. And if you, for example, wanted to get the pressure drop across a flow section or a flow device by using a differential manometer, so the working fluid can either be a gas or a liquid whose density is rho 1. So for example, you have here uh, a tube or a pipe that contains a fluid flowing in this cross section with density of rho 1. So the density of this fluid is rho 1. And you wanted to get the, the change in pressure from point 1 to point 2 in this uh, pipe. So you can use a differential manometer. You can insert the differential manometer at point 1 and at point 2 and then the density of the manometer fluid 
this manometer fluid with a density of raw 2 will experience an increase in an increase or a decrease in its height depending on the pressure so the differential height is the, the h so this is where you can use this now to get the the delta p from point 0.1 to point 0.2 in this pipe so the delta p or the difference in pressure in point 0.1 and point 0.2 is just the density of 1 minus the density the density of the working fluid flowing here and then the less the density of the where the the fluid in the manometer multiplied by the height um you multiply it also with gravity so it's uh, i forget to write the gravity example so a, nom a manometer is used to measure the pressure in a tank so the fluid used has a specific gravity of 0 0.85 and the manometer column height is 55 centimeter if the local atmospheric pressure is 96 kilopascal, determine the absolute pressure within the tank. So we wanted to get the absolute pressure within this tank. And we will use a manometer with a, using a, a fluid with a specific gravity of 0 0.85. So it is exposed to an atmospheric pressure of 96 kilopascal. So we are given with the SG, the specific gravity of the fluid in the manometer, 0 0.85. The pressure rise in the manometer or the height, uh, the increase in height is 50, 0.55 meter. We're also given with the atmospheric pressure of 96,000 Newton per meter square. The unknown is the absolute pressure in the tank. So to get the absolute pressure, the density of the manometer fluid first should be obtained. So that can be obtained by using the SG. So if we multiply its specific gravity with the density of water, then we can get the density of the fluid in the manometer. And that is 850 kilogram per meter cube. And using the relationship um, that we have earlier, so the absolute pressure is just PATM plus the raw GH. So the P atmosphere plus the density times gravity times the height. So the absolute pressure in the tank is 100,586.2 pascal or 100.6 kilopascal. So in that way, you can measure the pressure at the tank if you have that manometer with you. Another example, the water in a tank is pressurized by air and the pressure is measured by a multi-fluid manometer. The tank is located on a mountain at an altitude of 1,400 meters where the atmospheric pressure is 85.6 kilopascal. We want to determine the air pressure in the tank if H1 is equal to 0 0.1 meter, H2 is 0 0.2 meter, H3 is 0 0.35 meter. We take the densities of water, oil, and mercury to be 1,000 kg per meter cube, 850 kg per meter cube, and 13,600 kg per meter cube, respectively. So this is the tank and it is pressurized by air. So we wanted to get the pressure at the interface up of air and water. So we wanted to get the pressure at point 0.1. So what is the pressure at point 0.1 in the tank? So we are given here with H1, H2, H3, and we're also given with the density of water, density of oil, and the density of mercury. The unknown, uh, and also the atmospheric pressure is given so since it is located at in a mountain, it's expected that the atmospheric pressure is lesser than at, at the sea level. So the unknown is the pressure of air. So the pressure of air here is equal to the pressure at point 0.1, which is the pressure at the interface of air and water. So for a multi-fluid manometer, we can measure the pressure by measuring from the point 0.1 to the last point which is exposed to the atmosphere. So this is point 0.1, and we are going to measure all the way from point 0.1 to point 0.2. Take note that we can cancel out some parts of this manometer because as we go up and down, there's actually a, we can ca actually cancel out the change in pressure. So we will take the, the downward movement as positive and the upward as negative. So, how do we do that? Say, for example, we start at point 0.1. So we will add so the pressure moving downward as positive. So we have P1 plus, for the water here, you can see that we will move downward at the height of H1. 
So H1, so we have, so that, that's why we have here plus the density of water times gravity times H1. So we move downward. And as you can see here, as we move downward, we have a positive value. And then we move upward. It's, it's still water. So that's why this portion here will actually cancel out. So this portion here moving down and moving up to this point is will cancel out. So that's why we do not include that in the calculation. So that we just we have this one only. And then as we move to the oil, so we move up. So it's negative. So if we move up. And then we move down, it's positive. So take note, since it is oil, it will also cancel out the same fluid. So this portion here will just cancel out because we move up which is a negative, we move down, positive. So this will cancel out. And finally, we reach this particular point here, and then we encounter uh, oil at the height of H2. So to measure this, since this is moving down, so we are moving down in the measurement, so that's why we have here positive. Positive, the density of oil multiplied by G, multiplied by H2, so this height here. And then we move down again, so we reach the mercury. So we, as we move down, we encounter positive. And then we move up here, we, we encounter negative. So it will cancel out. So that we will not show it in the calculation anymore. It will cancel out. And then we move, we reach the mercury at this point here. And then we move up. So since we move up, we will have a negative value here. So that's why minus density of mercury G times H3. So all of this, we equate with the atmospheric pressure. So that is how you measure if you have a multi-fluid manometer starting from point your origin to the last point, which is the atmosphere. So we equate everything to the ATM. So moving down, positive, moving up, negative. So cancel out those parts that you can cancel out, just like this oil here, this mercury here, and this particular point here, which is the, the water. And then you arrange it so that you can get the desired value, which is P1. And you substitute all of the value. And then you can get the value of P1, which is 129,646.7 Pascal or 129.6 kilopascal. So you can see there in this problem that the pressure at 1 is, is actually a higher than the atmospheric pressure because the atmospheric pressure is 85.6 so the pressure of air is 129.6 kilopascal so it's so it's actually so there's a tendency for if for example this will have an opening here there will be a sudden gust of air so now that we have knowledge on the pressure measuring devices that will help us to analyze hydrostatic forces. It's time for us to analyze this hydrostatic forces on submerged plane surfaces. So example of submerged plane surfaces is for example the submerged surface of a dam. So there is a surface of a dam that's submerged to water so as you can see here. So that part experiences a hydrostatic force or a hydrostatic pressure also with a a ship that is um not moving or at rest so its um, bottom part experiences also a hydrostatic pressure exerted by the fluid so these are hydrostatic forces on the submerged plane surfaces so we will say submerged plane surfaces these are plate exposed to a liquid. Example is a gate valve in a dam, a wall of a liquid storage tank, a hull of a ship at rest, which are subjected to a fluid pressure. So they are subjected to a fluid pressure which is distributed over their surface. So for plane surfaces, the hydrostatic forces form a system of parallel forces. So what do we mean by that? We will determine that later on. So to determine the magnitude of that force and its point of application, which is called the center of pressure. So in analyzing uh, base surfaces, we wanted to get what is the magnitude of the force 
the resultant force acting on that surface because of the static fluid and also the point of application of that force. We call it the center of pressure. Say, for example, you have here a dam. So the surface of a dam is exposed to the hydrostatic forces from the fluid, the water. So when analyzing hydrostatic forces on submerged surfaces, the, the atmospheric pressure can be subtracted for simplicity. So when it acts on both sides of the structure. Say, for example, you have here a dam. Since both sides of the dam is exposed to the atmosphere, so this side here is exposed to the atmosphere and the other side is also exposed, this will eventually cancel out. That's why we can eliminate that to simplify our solution so that we can have just this profile here. So these are the distribution of pressures because we know right that pressure increases as it goes, it increases linearly. So that's what you can see here. An increase in the profile of the pressure as well as the forces because pressure and forces are just um, directly proportional also. So what we wanted to get is the magnitude of that normal force that this ocean, for example, exerts, or this dam, this water in the dam exerts, for example, in the surface here. So whether or not it's a safe, it's a safe level. So the pressure at the centroid of a surface is equivalent to the average pressure on the surface. Say, for example, you have a submerged um, object. It's submerged to a water of density, of a particular density. So the pressure at the centroid of this surface, so say for example, we measured, we locate the centroid and we found it somewhere here. So the pressure at that centroid is equivalent to the average pressure on the surface. So that's why the average pressure is equal to the pressure at the centroid. And we can get that by, by our knowledge that it is equivalent to the atmospheric pressure multiplied by the, this pressure gauge here. For the pressure gauge, the height is equivalent to the height of the center of this object submerged from the free surface. So the vertical height of that centroid. So you locate the centroid, you locate the vertical height, you multiply with HC, and also we add it with APM. Then you can get the average pressure that is being exerted by the fluid on that object that is submerged. The resultant force acting on a plane surface, on the other hand, is equal to the product of the pressure at the centroid that we determined a while ago of the surface and the surface area of that object submerged. And its line of action passes through the center of pressure. So you can see here, this is still the same object submerged. The resultant force that is acting on this object is equal to the product of the average the the average pressure or the pressure at the centroid and the area so and its center of and its line of action or with where it is it is uh, acting on is located at the it passes at the center of pressure so it's it's not necessarily at the centroid so it is somewhere at the center of pressure so the center of pressure is um if, for example, it is inclined, it is measured as YP, so that is the center of pressure, and YC is the, the distance of the free surface to the centroid, or the center, the center, centroid. So it's YC, the line of action or the center of pressure is located at YP. So I hope that you will not be confused with that. So if it is vertical, uh, perfectly vertical, then our YC would be easier to get because it will just be, um, we just divide it by 2. So you can see that PC is acting here, but the resultant force is acting at the center of pressure. So the average pressure is acting at the centroid, but the resultant force is acting at the center of pressure. pressure. So how do we get the value of YP? So the, the line where the center, the line of action or the center of pressure where the resultant force acts can be computed using this formula. So YP is equals to YC plus the 
as moments and the moment of this particular object that is submerged divided by this quantities that you can see here in the denominator that is yc plus the atmospheric pressure that's po this is the atmospheric pressure divided by rho g the sign of the inclination this angle here multiplied by the area of this object the surface area that of this object that is submerged so that is how you can get the value of yp so if it, the value of this centripetal moment is dependent on the profile also of the object that is submerged, uh, whether it is a rectangle, so you have a formula for Ixx as well as the area. Same also with circle, ellipse, triangle, semicircle, and semi-ellipse. So there is actually a table that lists all of the formula for the different uh, geometry. However, there are special cases wherein the submerged object is a rectangular plate. Say, for example, it's a perfectly it's a rectangle. Then you can use this shortcut formula um, for finding the resultant force. So again, the, for, the our purpose, our target is to get the resultant force, so that we will know uh, how we can counteract this resultant force to avoid, say, for example, the failure of the dam and also that we can design properly the system. So for a submerged rectangular plate, the, the S here denotes the distance from the free surface to the top part of this plate, and B is the, it's um, length or width, whether, whatever it is, no? then you have there the center of application of the resultant force is at YP. So the resultant force, if it is tilted, it's a tilted plate, which is a rectangular plate, can be computed using this formula. For a vertical plate, it's perfectly, perfectly vertical, then you can get the resultant force using this formula. And for a horizontal plate, then you can see that there is no value of S. All we have is H. Then we can get this, the, we can get the value as using this formula. So later on, we will be able to apply the vertical plate and the horizontal plate especially when dealing with curve um, and the hydrostatic analysis of curve submerged surfaces. So in order to get the YP for the YP for the submerged rectangular plate, so take note that this is only for a rectangular plate. So the general equation is found in the previous line that is with using the IXX, but if you have the rectangular plate, you can use this formula. So for all, for tilted, vertical, or horizontal. You just take note of the angle as well as the different value of S, as you can see in the illustration. So let us have an example for us to um, appreciate the formula. So we have here a heavy car uh, that Unfortunately, it experienced an accident and it plunges into the lake and lands at the bottom of a lake on its wheels. The door of this particular car is 1.2 meter high. So as you can see, it's the height of the door, we assume it's a square. It's 1.2 meter high and its width is 1 meter. And the top edge of the door is 8 meter below the free surface of the water. So the top of this door is 8 meter from the free surface of the water. We wanted to determine the average pressure, the hydrostatic force on the door, and the location of its uh, pressure center. And we wanted to discuss if the driver can open the door in this case. So here we are given with the S, which is eight meter, the distance from the free surface. The, the door is the height of the door, which is 1.2 meter its weed which is one meter and the unknown are the average pressure exerted by the fluid in the lake to the door the resultant hydrostatic force so the hydrostatic force that is acting on the door and uh, the location of this hydrostatic force which is the yp and we wanted to discuss whether the driver can open the door depending on the calculations later on so the door can be approximated as a vertical rectangular plate, as you can see here, since it's um, the door is standing. So 
we can approximate it as a vertical rectangular plate that we have in the previous um, presentation. And then we can also um, cancel out the atmospheric pressure because the atmospheric pressure is present at the top of the lake, which is the outside of this car, and also present at the inside of the car. Assuming that the, the car is not yet, uh, it's the, there's no, it's not filling with, it's not full of water yet. So meaning it's close. So therefore, there's still air present there. So that's why atmosphere is present both in the inside of the car and the outside of the car. That's why we can cancel that out in the analysis to make it easier. So for the average pressure, therefore, of this car, we can compute it using this formula, which is the atmospheric pressure multiplied by rho GHC. And also, uh, for this distance, this HC, this is the distance of the centroid from the surface. So we wanted to get that value. So for the distance of the centroid from the surface, we can see that this is the centroid of the, the, the window of this car added we add then we add the value of eight so we can use this formula in this case since this is vertical it's vertical the centroid from the surface is just equals to the yc so the hc is just equals to yc since this is a vertical plate and that is just equals to the s which is eight meter and then we move, move, we add the half of the height which is 1.2 divided by 2 or b over 2. So the distance of the centroid from the surface, so the distance of the centroid of this car, of the window of the car from the surface is s plus b over 2. And that is just equals also to yc because it happens to be vertical. Theory. If it is not vertical, it would not be equal. So if we substitute the value to our original equation, and since ATM can be cancelled out, this average pressure now will just become rho g, this rho g here, multiplied by the hc, which is the s plus v, b plus 2. So that is the formula for the average pressure for this scenario. So we base it here on this analysis, on this formula, that the average pressure is just equal to the pressure at the centroid. So the pressure at the centroid, which is equal to PHM plus the rho GHC. And since PATM can be cancelled out, that's why we cancel it. And then for the HC, since it is vertical, the here the plate is not vertical, but for the problem here, it's vertical. The HC is just equal to the YC. So this is how it looks like. So since it is vertical, our HC will just be equal to a, the YC. The location of the centroid. So substituting the value from the given, we can get the average pressure as 84,366 newton per meter squared or 84.4 kilopascal. So we're able to get the first unknown, which is the average pressure. So this average pressure acts at the centroid. So for the pressure, it acts at the centroid. It's 84.4 kilopascal. The resultant hydrostatic force on the door can now be computed by using the simple formula. The resultant force is just equal to the pressure times the area. So the pressure, therefore, is just the average pressure. And the area is the area that this pressure is acting on, right? And that is just equal to the area of the, the, the surface area of the window, which is A times B. So when we substitute these values, we can get the resultant hydrostatic force acting on the door. And that is 101,239.2 Newton. So the last question is to determine where this force is acting. So where this force, this particular force is acting upon. Since if we know the uh, where this force is acting, we will not try to uh, counteract it. So we will try to find a way in order to counteract this force so that we can get out of that car. So the location of the center of pressure can be computed using this formula for a vertical plate, right? For a, If it's a rectangular vertical plate, so we can use this shortcut formula. However, 
if we wanted to derive that, we can use the general formula. So this is the general formula for the location of the center of pressure. So this formula here that you can see is if we wanted to get use the shortcut for a vertical rectangular plate. But if we wanted to derive, we will use this general equation. And since our ATM can be can be cancelled out since in our assumption it acts at uh, both sides of the car then we can cancel out this term here PO over rho g sine theta so we can cancel out that portion that's why it's a zero here and for the YC we were able to get it a while ago that it is equal to S plus B2 so we just put it here S plus B2 also it and the inside of the parenthesis of the bracket here for the area, it's just equals to AB. And for the centroidal moment of inertia, it's AB cube over 12 for a rectangle. So for a circle, it's different. For ellipse, it's different. But for a rectangle, it's AB cube over 12. And since the height here is the B, that's why it's the one that is raised to the power of 3. So AB cube over 12. So B here is the height. So if you're going to... Uh, solve it using this formula and this formula you can actually get the same result so when you substitute the value from the given you can get the yp the location where the the location of the pressure center or where the force the resultant force will act is at 86.1 meter from the surface so the measurement here is 8.61 meter from the surface so that means it's if the distance from the surface to the top of the door is 8 meter, then the distance from the top of the door to the center of the location of this force is 0.61 meter. So the location is somewhere uh, below, no, the, since it's 1.2 meter, it's somehow at the, at the middle because half of, half of 1.2 is 0.6. So we can say that it's just at the middle of the the window so the strongest force acts on that particular part so this is how it looks like so we have here the s and then this b here is the this is the window this is the height of the window so half of that is where the somewhere here no at 0.61 meter below this top portion is where the force acts So for a driver, uh, to answer the question whether the driver can open the door, usually a strong person can lift 100 kilogram, which is equivalent to uh, 981 newton or about 1 kilonewton. Also, a person can apply a force at a point farthest from the hinges, which is 1 meter farther for a maximum effect and generate a moment of 1 kilonewton meter. The resultant hydrostatic force acts under the midpoint of the door, just like what we discussed a while ago. And that's a distance of 0.5 meter from the hinges. This will generate a moment of 50.6 kilonewton meter in which about 50 times the moment the, the driver can possibly generate. Therefore, if we, if we try to open the door at that particular point, it is possible to, for the driver to open the door of the car. So the driver's best bet is to let some water in by rolling the window down a little for example and to keep his or her head close to the ceiling the driver should be able to open the door shortly before the car is filled with water since at the point the pressure on both sides of the door are nearly the same and opening the door in the water is almost as easy as opening it in the air so luckily this driver can still be able to get out of that car and if that person knows how to swim then he can eventually go to the surface and be rescue so now that we learned how to compute or analyze the hydrostatic force on submerged plane surfaces let us try to apply this knowledge in analyzing hydrostatic forces on submerged curved surfaces so this is an example of a submerged curved surfaces so you can see here we have a gate that's uh, that's keeping the water from this reservoir from um, flooding the area so this is a gate actually and then uh, somewhere in the gate we have here a hinge so it will it will open or close depending on that
kind of force, hydrostatic force, that is being applied by the water. So that's why we wanted to analyze whether how much force can this gate be able to sustain before it will open and flood the, the community, for example. So the easiest way to determine that is that resultant hydrostatic force acting on two-dimensional curved surface is to determine horizontal and the vertical component, which are the FH and FD respectively. So to determine the hydrostatic force acting on submerged curved surfaces, for example, just one, we have here a submerged curved surface, and we wanted to get the hydrostatic force acting on that, the resultant, and where it is located, what we're going to do is to project it both in the horizontal and in the vertical uh, vertical position. You can see here the horizontal projection of the curved surface and then we have the vertical projection of the curved surface. If we're going to cut out that part, we have this one here. We can actually analyze it just like how we analyze the plane. So for the horizontal projection, you can see that there is a force acting on that portion here. That is the Fy. And for the vertical position, there is a hydrostatic force here that acts also somewhere here at its center of pressure, the Fx. And since we analyze this fluid here, we have to also include in the analysis the weight of that fluid. That's why we have here the weight. So if we wanted to get the resultant of this Fy weight and Fx, we can use our knowledge on finding the resultant of the vectors. So the resultant is just the, the, the resultant of the horizontal forces and the vertical forces acting on this particular uh, volume of water. So that is how we determine the hydrostatic force acting on a submerged curved surface. So our horizontal force in this Situation, for example, is just equals to the Fx. The vertical force is the sum of the Fy and the weight because they are in the same direction. So the vertical force is Fy plus the weight. So there are instances, however, that the, the curved surface is found above the liquid. So in that case, the weight of the liquid and the vertical component are on the opposite direction. So that's why you have to deduct. So the FV now will become FY minus weight, just like this example. So the weight is moving downward, whereas the project projection of the the projection of the horizontal surface is at the bottom. So it's the force now would be acting upward because the water is below, right? If the water is the one that will act, that will that will exert this force. So it's some since it is at the bottom, then it will act upward. Same also here, it, since it is at the left side, it will act to the left. So that is how we also take note of the changes whenever the, wherever the position of the curved surface is. So let us try to use this knowledge in analyzing this example. So we have here a long solid cylinder of radius 0 0.8 meter. So this is a solid cylinder. Its radius is 0 0.8 meter. So this is actually as a front view but this is actually a cylinder so it is not a sphere so it is a cylinder so you can imagine that it is if you're going to look at the side view or the top view it is actually a cylinder so it is a long solid cylinder the radius is 0 0.8 meter hinge at point a so it is hinge at point a here it is used as an automatic gate so it serves as the gate for this water here so when the water level of this gate reaches 5 meter, it is designed that the gate open by turning about the hinge at point A. So since this is a hinge, it is free to move, it is free to rotate. So when the, the hydrostatic force is enough, it will eventually open. When the hydrostatic pressure or force exerted by this uh, fluid is enough then it can open so it is said that it will open when the height is at five meter so say for example you are an engineer and you are designing a gate and then when the flood came and then the flood reaches to five meter the gate will open 
you are going to design these gates in such a way that it will not open so that it will not flood the community so that's how you can look at this problem in front in in practical terms so you have to make sure that the weight of the cylinder is sufficiently enough so that it can hold the water even if the height is already five meter but for this case you wanted to determine the hydrostatic force acting on the cylinder and its line of location when the gate opens and also the weight of the cylinder per meter length of the cylinder that can withstand this opening so the given are the radius of the cylinder the the height of the 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 portion that we are going to analyze which is the hinge no it is 4.2 meter from the surface because it's 5 meter minus 0 0.8 since we know that the radius is also that's the same here it's also r so that's why 5 minus 0 0.8 is also 4.2 so that's why s is 4.2 meter the width is 1 meter because we assume that it's per meter length of the cylinder so 1 meter and then the unknown are the, the hydrostatic force acting on the cylinder as well as its line of action which is the theta so the line of action now is with respect to this point, the center of the cylinder. This is the theta. And also we wanted to get the weight of this cylinder. So what we wanted to get is this FR. How much is this FR that this water exerts on this gate? And the weight of the cylinder that can withstand that, uh, that moment at the hinges A. And also the angle for which it is acting upon. So here in this analysis, we can also cancel out the atmospheric pressure because as you can see, it acts here at the left side, it also acts here on the right side, then atmospheric pressure can be canceled out in the analysis. If we're going to draw the diagram of this portion here, what we can actually cut out a horizontal and vertical projection just like how we can analyze it really. So we are going to cut out a horizontal a horizontal projection and a vertical projection so when we cut out we will obtain this one so this we cut out this particular volume of water so this particular volume of in this particular volume of water it has a weight so this is the w and at the bottom of that what of that water it has it is exerting a vertical force fy and in here and this part here it there is a hydrostatic force acting on this particular vertical plane, Fx. So what we are going to get is the Fr, which is the, the resultant of the sum of the, the horizontal forces and the sum of the vertical forces. So for the horizontal force on the vertical surface, so this is the Fx. So we wanted to get this Fx. This is actually similar to our previous problem that we have a vertical plane just like that car, it's a vertical plane, and we wanted to get the, the horizontal force or the resultant force acting on that particular plane. So that is how we can analyze this Fx. So that is the horizontal force. So the horizontal force is just equal to the Fx because there are no other horizontal force here. So this is just the Fx, and we learned a while ago that it just it is just equal to the average pressure multiplied to the area. And since we can cancel out the atmospheric pressure, then basically it will just be rho g, the hc, which is the centroid of this volume of water from the surface, times the area, which is the area of this uh, projection of this cylinder. So therefore, since we know that hc is just the sum of the, the distance from the surface and then the half of this, uh, the centroid acts at half now, it's just half because it's our we can project it as a rectangle now so the height is s uh, the height is r the radius divided by 2 so that's why we have here s distance from this free surface to the top plus half of this vertical height which is r over 2 so that's why we have here this one then you just substitute these values then we can get the value of if a the horizontal force on this vertical surface as 36.1 kilonewton and for the vertical force on the horizontal surface the vertical force can be computed 
using if you're going to look back at the free body diagram again we can just compute it using the p average also times the area and the p average is still raw ghc times the area so the hc now would be from the top to the bottom because the force now is acting here at the surface so the center of that vertical line now would be at the the bottomest part which is just the five meter so that's why we can our hc here is now five meter because you can see that it's just um, very small the half of that plate is just very small so we can approximate this at five meter and then we also have the same value for the water and the gravity and the area so we can get also the vertical force on the horizontal surface at the bottom as 39.24 kilonewton so this is the vertical force it is acting at the bottom so this bottom part of the water is 5 meter from the surface that's why it's 5 meter for the weight of the fluid we will get the weight of the fluid per meter length so you can see that the weight is always downward so we wanted to get this weight so the weight of this section of water of the width of liquid so the weight is just equal to mass times gravity right and since mass is density times volume we can have density times volume times gravity as equal to the weight and for the volume of we are referring here to the volume of the water so the volume of the water is just equal to the volume of this particular water here so if we're going to get the volume we wanted to get first the area the cross-sectional area times the width right so that's why we have here this cross-sectional area multiplied by the width. So this is the cross-sectional area. So how do we get that? If we're going to analyze it, we can actually create a square, a square with sides R, and then we deduct the, the quarter circle to get this particular shaded region. So that's why we have here R squared minus the quarter the area of the quarter circle which is pi r squared over 4 and we multiply it with the width so that we can get the volume so when you substitute now the value you can get the the weight of the fluid which is 1.35 kilonewton so now that we have them we can get also the net of the vertical force the net upward vertical force so based on the diagram it's just fy minus w because they are the two vertical forces acting on this particular section so that's why fy minus width so substituting those values that we already obtained then we can get the vertical force the net upward vertical force as 37.9 kilonewton so now that we have the fv and the fh then we can use the uh, pythagorean theorem to get fr so using this triangle this this diagram here, we know, we know that FR is just the hypotenuse of FV and FH. But then our FR is just equals to 52.3 kilonewton. So the value of the hydrostatic force acting on this um, cylinder is 52.3 kilonewton. So we're able to answer the first question. For the second unknown, which is the line of action of this force, the theta. So the theta with respect to this horizontal uh, with respect to this horizontal line here that is the theta the line of action where it will act on this particular gate the line of action can be obtained by using the formula if you are going to analyze we can actually draw a triangle here a triangle with um, with the same uh, profile as that of our fv and fh so the theta is just tan negative one of the vertical divide the ratio of the vertical force and the horizontal force so that's why our line of action is at 46.4 degrees and finally we need to get now the weight of the cylinder needed so when the water level is 5 meter the gate is about to open and thus the reaction force at the bottom of the cylinder is, is zero then the forces other than those at the hinges acting on the cylinder are its weight acting through the center and the hydrostatic force exerted by the the water so therefore we can create a moment so we can take a moment at this hinge because it is it will rotate now 
it will rotate because of this force however it will be counteract this there will be a counteract moment because of this weight so this force will rotate it counterclockwise but this weight will rotate it clockwise so to open it must overcome this particular weight so we will take a moment at point a at the location of the hinge and we will equate it to zero to get the the necessary weight of the cylinder so if we're going to take the moment the, we know that moment is just force times the moment arm so the force here is fr so we take the the counterclockwise as the positive direction so that's why since fr is it will create a moment counterclockwise uh, with respect to this hinge so we have your fr we multiply it with the moment arm so the moment arm of fr is its line of action the perpendicular distance of its line of action from the hinge so this is the fr uh, this is the moment arm this uh, line here and that is just equals to the hypotenuse sine of the angle theta so that's why we have r sine theta and minus since this is the cylinder weight is will create a moment that is opposite that of the counterclockwise which is clockwise so that's why it's minus and its moment arm or its distance that is the perpendicular distance of its uh, action with respect to the hinge is r it's 0.8 meter that's why we have r and we equated the zero so that we can obtain equilibrium at that point and we can obtain the necessary weight of cylinder so rearranging we can cancel out r and we can substitute now the value then we can get the weight of the cylinder as 37.9 kilonewton therefore if you are an engineer and if you wanted to ensure that when the height of the water is at 5 meter that the dam will not break or will not open then you have to make sure that the weight of the cylinder that you will place here should be 37.9 kilonewton so you have to find a material therefore that you can put here so that it can give us this particular weight of 37.9 kilonewton. So now that we were able to understand the hydrostatic forces on submerged curved surfaces, finally we are down to our last topic, which is the buoyancy. So there are buoyancy can be applied both for object that is flying. Uh, maybe we are wondering why these objects can fly, not even if they are very heavy just like this um, cargo plane and also this um, uh, tanker even if they are so heavy why is it that they can float in air and in water so the reason of that is because of buoyancy so buoyancy gives an object a lighter feel and makes them way less in liquid than in air so the, this is the force that will tend to lift the body of the object and this force is caused by the increase of the pressure in the fluid with depth. So as the, the more the fluid is submerged with depth, the more buoyant force it will ex experience. So this is actually, the, it is actually the pressure also of the fluid that causes buoyant force. So for example, you have here a submerged object so the 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 more it is submerged the more buoyant force it will experience so the difference between the top the two forces acting on the top and at the bottom of this object is what we call the buoyant force so if we're going to analyze it so the force at the bottom minus force at the top is the buoyant force if we substitute the force at the bottom at the top so since we have this value here then the buoyant force will just be equal to the, the density of the fluid multiplied by gravity, the height, and then the area. So the buoyant force is just equal to, therefore, since height and area is just equal to the volume, is just equal to the, the density of the fluid multiplied by the gravity and the volume. So therefore, the buoyant force is dependent on the fluid, the density of the fluid, the gravity and the volume of the object that is uh, submerged. So therefore, the the greater the volume, just like of a tanker, just like that of a plane, the, the greater the buoyant force will also be. That is the reason why they can actually overcome the weight 
they can actually float. This is actually what we call the Archimedes principle, which states that the buoyant force acting on a body immersed in a fluid is just equals to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body, and it acts upward through the centroid of the displaced volume. So therefore, our buoyant force can be equated to the weight of the fluid that is displaced. So if we are going to give the to find their values and analyze them further, the FB we have is this later at uh, earlier this volume this value for the weight is just equals to the density of the object because we know that weight is mass times gravity right so the the, the mass is just equals to the density times the volume of the object so that's why this this density and this volume here refers to the object the total well for this volume here is the submerged portion only so therefore we wanted to get the we wanted to get the relationship between the the density and the volume of the submerged portion of an object and the total volume of the object then we can use this relationship so the submerged volume divided by the total volume is just equals to the average density of that object divided by the density of the fluid. So this is the reason why there are some objects that floats, there are some objects that, that are suspended, and there are some objects that sink. So if the density of the fluid based on this formula, if the density of the fluid is greater than the density of the object, then the body will float. However, if the density is equal, then the body will be uh, suspended. It's neutrally buoyant. But if the density of that object is greater than the density of the fluid, it will sink. Um, we will ex the body will sink in the fluid. So it's actually dependent on the density of the fluid and the density of the object, whether it will float, whether it will suspend, or whether it will sink. So that's why in the design of this, the cargo tanker, for example, or a ship, or a plane, you have to ensure that it's it, the, the design that you wanted to have. So for example, we have here a crane. So this crane uh, is used to lower the heights, then to lower the weights, this concrete block into the sea. Say for example, you are building a bridge just like the the Mactan, Cordova, Cebu, Link, Sicilex. So they are uh, putting some foundation for example for that. So they are trying to lower this into the sea. So this crane is used to lower weights into the sea which is a density of 1025 kilogram per meter cube for an underwater construction project. So we are going to determine the tension in the rope, this rope here connecting to the crane due to the rectangular 4, 4 by 4, 0.4 by 0.4 by 3 meter concrete block, which is a density of 2,300 kilogram per meter cube when it is suspended in the air and it is completely immersed in the water. So we are to determine the tension of the rope in air and the tension um, in water. So we are given with the density of the fluid, the density of the concrete, the length, the width, and the height of this concrete, and thus we are to determine the, the tension of the rope in air and the detention of the rope in water. So for when the black is suspended in the air, obviously we can immediately immediately get the value by using N, uh, the balance of forces. Since the two forces acting are the tension force and the weight, we can equate them. So the tension force in air is just equal to the weight of the concrete block. So for the weight of the concrete block, it is equal to the density of the concrete block multiplied by its volume and the gravity. So substituting the value for the volume of the concrete we can get that by getting the product of the length, width, and the height, and that is 4.48 meter cube. So we can substitute now this value so that we can obtain the tension force in the rope when it is suspended in air, and that is 10.8 kilonewtons. So you can see 
the tension force is 10.8 kilonewton when suspended in air. So let us try to compare this later on when it is suspended now and when it is now in the water, completely immersed in the water. So for the water condition, when the black is completely immersed in the water, there are forces, there are two forces, three forces now that's acting here. We have the tension force, we have the weight, and then we have the buoyant force. So we know that buoyant force will always act upward, so that's why it's that the arrow here is upward. So if you're going to create a force balance, we can derive this equation, right? This is equals to the weight minus the buoyant force is equals to the tension of the rope when it is completely immersed in the water. So for the weight, we already solved that kanina. So the problem now is to get the buoyant force. So for the buoyant force, it is equals to, again, the density of the fluid. So take note, it's not the density of the concrete, but density of the fluid multiplied by the volume submerged. So since it is completely submerged, then we can just substitute the volume of the concrete. However, if there are problems that it is not completely submerged, you will just compute the vol The volume here will just be the volume that is submerged by Archimedes principle, right? So, if we substitute those values that we already computed a while ago, the weight and these values here for the water and then the volume of the concrete, then the tension in the rope when it is completely immersed in the water, when the concrete block is completely immersed in the water, is 6 kilonewton. So you can see now that from 10.8 kilonewton, when it's suspended in air, we experience lesser weight, a lesser tension, which is 6 kilonewton. So it's approximately 55% reduction in the tension when it is completely submerged in the water. So that is the effect of the buoyant force for the object that is submerged in the water. So in summary, in this lesson, we're able to understand the different pressure uh, system as well as the ways to measure them. And we also apply these knowledges in order for us to analyze the hydrostatic forces on submerged plane as well as submerged curved surfaces and eventually understand the concept of buoyancy and its effect on the object that is submerged to us to the wind.